Why do so many leaders fall? Because of money, sex, or power. My mother was born on the most eastern part of Canada. It's called Newfoundland. On the east side of that, right on the Atlantic Ocean, her father was a fisherman. They lived in a village that had no roads, no electricity, no running water. You could only get to it by boat. But she tells me that icebergs used to come into the bay in the summer from the north. And they would get into their boats and row out. Those young women and men would row out, pick off the ice. And from that, they would make ice cream, which explains my addiction genetically to vanilla ice cream. <laughs> but an iceberg is nine-tenths under the water, one-tenth above. And people are like that. A leader has credentials, a doctorate or something, and charisma. Whoa, you just want to be with that person. But underneath, they could be very insecure people with a need for status, power, or intimacy. One of those three. Very, very dangerous. Need for status. Followers trust the charisma and the credentials. But what they really need to trust is character. They need to trust character. Because what happens if they only trust the credentials and the charisma is they eventually get disappointed, very disappointed. Money is the need for status and power. Sex, the need for intimacy. I've seen even Christian leaders who have a desire for intimacy, but they are not capable of developing an intimate relationship with another human being. And so they intuitively go into an occupation, pastoral work or counseling, where they're going to have confidences given to them. I've seen it happen over and over again. They're sitting ducks for a sexual affair. And the power is, again, the need for status. Now, money is very significant. How we relate to money is an indication of where our heart is, where your treasure is, Jesus said. There will your heart be also. Where's your treasure? How we spend money is a barometer of our priorities and our treasure, how we spend money. Ultimately, Jacques Ellul, French Christian, said, we follow what we have loved most intensively, either into eternity or into death. And a Jewish author said, the gods we worship write their names on our faces. Be sure of that. May, we may think that our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our heart, but it will out. That which dominates our imagination and our thoughts will determine our life and character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we're worshiping, for what we are worshiping, we are becoming. Psalm 135, we become like the God we worship. And if you worship an idol, you become like it. So there is a spiritual significance to money. How we relate to money can be a means of spiritual growth and draw us closer to God, or it can be the reverse. And the amount of money we have or make can indicate not only our self-worth, but our net worth. Our, not only our net worth, but our self-worth. Why? does money have such a hold on us? There's a Jewish sermon or midrash on the priestly benediction in Numbers 6. And you know it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 
Here's the sermon. May the Lord bless you means to be blessed with wealth and possessions. And may God keep you means may God keep you your wealth and possessions from possessing you. Very interesting. Money is not neutral. It's one of the powers. The powers were created, according to Colossians 1, by God and for God. It is good that God placed us in a structured universe and ordered. Uh, One archbishop said, it's a cosmos, not a chaos. But those powers became fallen, intransigent, and hostile to God's purposes. So good things, good institutions, good principalities became fallen, intransigent, resistant. But Christ by his cross, Colossians 2, disarmed the powers demonstrated their illusionary power and triumphed over them. Over his cross was a title, the king of the Jews, in what three languages? Now the correct answer is not Jesus. The Sunday school teacher said, what's brown, furry, lives in trees, and eats nuts? And the Sunday school student said, I know the right answer is Jesus but it sounds like a squirrel to me. So what are the three languages that was over the cross of Jesus, the King of the Jews, in three languages? Aramaic or Hebrew, Latin, and Greece. Greek. Greek, the language of culture. Latin, the language of government. And Aramaic or Hebrew, the language of religion, what put him on the cross? Culture, government, religion. But he triumphed over them through resurrection, showed their illusionary power. We live in the conflict of the ages. The old age and the new age overlapping until Christ comes again. So the powers in scripture range from structures such as government and rulers that are ecclesiastical or juridical, right through to money or mammon, death, and evil spiritual beings, the demonic. And to say that money is a power is to say it is not neutral. And that's what people want to say. Just a medium of exchange. It's not. It's a power. We even use in North America, it's not the almighty peso, but the almighty dollar. Okay? But we use that phrase, the almighty dollar. And Jesus used the phrase, the mammon of iniquity. Mammon. Now, what you don't know probably is that mammon is the same word in Aramaic as amen. Mammon, amen. Mammon is what we trust for our security. Amen is saying, I want this to be definite and true. I want this to happen. So if you're in a sleepy prayer meeting and people are dropping off, at the end of the prayer just say, mammon, instead of amen. They'll wake up. But it's related, you see. Mammon is what people are trusting for security. The powers range, as I said, from the demonic right through to evil structures on the far right. And uh, I know this is complicated and it should deserve a lot more, more time than I have. But various Christians have emphasized really only one way in which we experience the powers whether it is through the demonic uh, by deliverance or structures that have been colonized by Satan, which the Anabaptists and Mennonites deal with by suffering, powerlessness, and prayer. Most mainline denominations 
deal with structures and say we should get involved and make a difference as regents and some liberation Christians in South America, not exclusively but mainly, say we should engage in civil disobedience and a just war to deal with the elimination of these structures. Money's a power because it's capable of moving other things and claims a certain kind of autonomy. It's invested with spiritual powers that can enslave us. It can replace single-minded love for God and relationships with neighbors, with buying, selling relationships in which even a soul is bought. It is more or less personal. So Joseph, the righteous, and Jesus are sold. It easily becomes an alternative God. It can do things to us negatively. It can do things to us positively. But it can facilitate kingdom building exchange. So if we want to gain, we need a lot more time on this, a biblical theology of money, we turn first to the Older Testament and we find there's a kind of double message. On one hand, money can be a great blessing. On the other hand, money can be a problem. When we turn to the New Testament, we see Jesus talked a lot about money. I mean, some analysis says that he talked more about money than he did about heaven. He gave the parable of the rich fool who said, I've got all this stuff, going to take my life easy now, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said, you fool. He spoke about treasures in heaven. Oh, I wish he'd said, by that I mean. And then the shrewd manager in Luke 16, the rich in the kingdom of God. A rich person, it's hard for the rich, not impossible but like going through the eye of a needle as a camel. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20, very interesting context. He's not saying it's more blessed to give money than to receive money. He's actually saying there, Paul, he's saying, I supported myself as an apostle because it's more blessed to give ministry free of charge than to receive. And then in a critical text, in Matthew twenty two twenty one, Jesus said, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Jesus paid taxes to Caesar, a corrupt government. His response to the tax question was, Give what is Caesar's to Caesar, and to God what is God's. And I think, along with a Jewish author, that's the nub of the matter. How can we use money to fulfill our earthly temporal needs while we must also fulfill our obligation to eternal realities? Or more exactly, how can we give to Caesar and to God at the same time? I think this is the issue behind being rich towards God and storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Paul goes on to talk about giving as a means of ministry and blessing. Romans 15, where he got the Gentile Christians to give to the poor Jews. Generosity in 2 Corinthians 9. And God loves a hilarious giver. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Not to trust in riches. Uh, laying up for ourselves a firm foundation for the coming age. So, how to deal with money? Money can be used in such a way that we build friendships with people through Christ. Friendships that will last for eternity. So that they precede us and welcome us into the new heaven and new earth. Money can be a means of advancing the kingdom of God. We need to renounce money as a God, as mammon, and recognize that God is the owner and we are stewards. So here's a cartoon. Well, Charles, when I baptize you, everything that goes under belongs to God. 
I'm sorry. The folks out of the way. Use God's money to build relationships through Christ that will last into eternity. Invest in people and the kingdom of God. In Luke 16, Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth, unrighteous mammon, to gain friends for yourselves so that when it, that's money, is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal habitations. The story, as you know it, a guy who's going to be fired, he goes to his boss's creditors and said, how much do you owe my boss? And they said, well, 30,000 gallons of oil. Oh, let's make that 20,000 gallons of oil. They loved him. And he goes to another guy, how much do you owe my master? Oh, one half ton of wheat. Oh, let's make it a quarter ton of wheat. Oh, they loved him. And when he was fired, they took him into their homes. And Jesus says, use money to build relationships. That's not buying friendship. To build relationships that are going to last into eternity. And these people will receive you into the new heaven and new earth. Delp develop the discipline of stewardship. Tithing plus. Give to God's global work. Give to the poor. Give to the church. And give to people. Find a way of tithing plus. Giving is a way of profaning mammon. That is, taking something that has a negative pull on us and making it into a positive. We can do this by paying our taxes with a glad and generous heart. Most Christians don't do that. But Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And when you are paying your taxes, you're actually loving your neighbor because you're providing for an infrastructure by which your neighbors can live and thrive. Give directly to the poor with no strings attached. Give to God's global work. Be ready, if so commanded, to sell all and follow and develop an accountability group. Meet with them and let them help you figure out how to do it. Nurture contentment. Practice continuous thanksgiving. Pray while you watch advertisements, whether you're in a, in a taxi or light rapid transit going down Edsel, you see all these advertisements, but pray, watch advertisements. Watching advertisements is a spiritual discipline. Pray when you go out to buy something. Adopt a lifestyle of enough. Be a hilarious, cheerful giver of time, talents, and treasures. Not stingy, but generous heart. And if commanded, be ready to leave all. John Wesley said, gain all you can. Save all you can. And give all you can. I want to end with some thoughts on how to get rich slowly. I told you that many, many years ago, I heard somebody speak in this room on how to get rich fast. But I want to talk about how to get rich slowly. True riches, I think true with wealth is being able to provide for yourself and your loved ones. Secondly, to contribute to a kingdom which will never end. Thirdly, to belong to a forever family of relationships in Christ that will transcend death. Oh, I'm a wealthy man. A forever family of friends in Christ. Oh, man. And then have a multi-generational inheritance of values, virtues, 
purposes, experiences, work, and material assets that can be passed on to others as a blessing. I don't normally tell people about this, but uh, because I'm 78, I almost died last June, and uh, by God's grace, I had amazing surgery, and uh, I'm with you. But it is, um, it's a sobering thing to have a near-death experience. And I decided it was a good time to pass on to our children and our grandchildren our values and what makes us tick as a couple. And so I created a book of 40 family stories, stories with images and text. And last Christmas, we gave it to every one of our children and grandchildren as a kind of, this is part of our inheritance to you, multi-generational inheritance of values, virtues, and purposes. Knowing and loving God and being known and loved by God. Oh, you're a rich person, wealthy person. If you know that God loves you. Do you know, my colleague J.I. Packer has written a magnificent book called Knowing God. But you know what? He doesn't. I mean, he does. But he doesn't know God through and through. Because even the Apostle Paul said, now that we have known come to know God, or rather, he says, are known by God. Oh, I don't know God very much. But he knows me through and through. Psalm 139, before I stand up, sit down, before I speak the every word, he knows everything. And he loves me. Oh, how wealthy you are. And then experiencing joy and peace in God. Oh, this is true wealth having a wonderful destiny that will last beyond the grave, not grace, in the new heaven and the new earth. Investing in the kingdom of God, embracing the purpose of God, treasuring the priorities of God, which is people and the people of God, and hungering for the presence of God. So something for you to take home and think about is this very simple phrase, which is the three points of John Wesley's sermon on the use of money. Gain all you can. Don't sit back and wait for somebody to look after you. Gain all you can. But don't do it, he went on to say, in a way that's hurtful to your body or hurtful to other people. But really get in there. Work hard. But save all you can, which means live simply. And then give all you can. Okay. 